to a design principle that you've nailed to the wall and say, well, actually, in this case, we should be considering you know, the authors rather than the implementers, right? And also, I, I like this because this gives me lots of power, frankly. Um, Ian Hickson has always said, if there's a browser maker out there that disagrees with a new feature in HTML5 and says, I will never implement that feature in my browser, then that feature just comes out of HTML5. Because he says, what's the point of putting a feature that's not going to be implemented into the spec? The spec would just be fiction. Right? It would be a lovely spec, but it would never actually work on the web. So if a browser maker refuses to implement something, it comes out of the spec. Browser makers are implementers. We are authors. Right? That's us, the authors part. Second only to users. So if we disagree with something in the spec, or we feel strongly about the way something should work in HTML5, our voice should carry even more weight than browser makers, than the implementers. I like that. I like that, I like that feeling of power. Um, and it, it's basically what it's doing is recognizing this fact, that when you're building something, when you're building a website, when you're building some kind of software, there will be disagreements, and frankly recognizing that you aren't impartial. You have beliefs when you're building software, and those beliefs will come through to the end user. It is inevitable. You have to recognize that. Software is inherently political. So uh, there's a bunch of open source projects, other projects out there, where they have nailed their principles to the wall, so to speak. They've published them in the URL. So uh, the Mozilla Foundation have a manifesto, it's maybe six, seven points, where they, they lay down what they think is important. So if you, if you read that manifesto and think, you know what, that's important to me as well, you're probably going to get along well with the Mozilla Foundation. If you disagree with the manifesto, chances are you're not going to work well on the Mozilla project, right? And that's, that's a good thing to have the design principle up front. And it's okay to disagree with them, it's just find the project that works for you. Um, microformats, they very much have, have design principles. Plenty of them. This is the one that probably drives everything. What it really comes back to is, is design for humans first, machines second. Again, it seems obvious. How else would you do it? But there are a bunch of other formats out there that are the other way around, where the, the machine readability is more important than how easy it is to author or how easy it is to use, right? And for me, this fits with my mentality. So I like microformats. I get involved with microformats because of these principles. And actually, microformats has a whole bunch of other principles that pretty much coincide with the HTML5 ones. A lot of the HTML5 design principles came from microformats, you know, solving existing pro uh, problems, you know, paving the cow paths that started microformats. Um, really good examples of design principles for, for a project, for a, an open uh, collaborative project. When Mark and Lisa uh, were brought on board to help design Drupal Southern Interface, um, they came up with some design principles. When I say came up with, I don't mean they just scribbled them down on a piece of paper. Right? This took a long time for them to hammer out, right? to, to distill it down to these four points. It's really important. And actually, so I was chatting with Mark this morning, those two middle ones are the, the ones that kept coming up again and again. Right? Was you had to, you know, privilege the content creator. And this other one, design for the 80%. So this is an example of the Pareto principle, the 80-20 distribution. Right? You, uh, Pareto was the Italian economist who noticed that 20% of the wealth, sorry, 80% of the wealth was in the hands of 20% of the population. Um, you plot that in the graph and you get this classic power law distribution curve. It's something you see again and again in nature, in society, networks, all the time. This power law distribution, this Pareto principle, and it's something, again, that the microformats community used. They acknowledged from the start, you know what? We won't please everyone. You can't please everyone. So it's only going to take 20% of the effort to reach 80% of the use cases. If you try and reach 100% of the use cases, that last 20% is going to take 80% more effort. You have to acknowledge that. Mark and Lisa acknowledged that with Drupal. And you're going to have to accept that. You can't please everyone. right? If you do, it's designed by committee. You end up pleasing no one. So when they decided we're going to privilege the content creator, we're going to design for the 80%, that's really good. Now, some people aren't going to be happy about that, and I understand that, but I think, I think it's good. No matter, it's going to hurt, but it's a, it's a really good design principle. That's, I mean, this is kind of from the point of view of the, the interface of Drupal. And then on the, on the code side, Drupal.org has a principles document, which is excellent. Like I say, I think you know, every project should have something like that nailed to the wall. And this is an interesting one that I pulled out of this. But this is, this is thought of as important to the Drupal community. High quality, elegant, documented code is a priority over roughed in functionality. Again, it seems obvious. How else would you want to do a project? Well, actually, this isn't, this isn't necessarily an obvious way to, to build software. 
And in some ways, this flies in the face of a lot of uh, very successful software projects that have used a, an older principle, a principle that kind of drives the web, which is rough consensus and running code. Right, so there are competitors to Drupal out there that this principle would apply to far more. Is, so someone who, who likes the Drupal mentality of, oh yes, you know, elegant, clean code, would not get on well uh, in a community where it's, it's rough consensus and running code. But I actually, I'm kind of into rough consensus and running code. I kind of like it, so I don't think, you know, I'm not, I'm not much of a back-end developer, but if I were, I'm not sure how well I would get on with the Drupal community. I'm, I like rough consensus and running code, and frankly, this is one of the reasons why I like HTML5. Right? That they managed to bring this spirit from the WWG to the W3C of rough consensus and running code. And I like that. I'm going to leave it there. If you want to uh, hit me up on Twitter, uh, I'm Adaptio on Twitter, and we're using a DC keynote as the hashtag. Uh, I've got a website, adaptio.com. Occasionally I blog about HTML5 there, so uh, if you're interested in that, you can check it out. And it's shameless, but I also have a book, so you can read the book too. Um, but thank you very much for your time and attention. Okay. Um, is there any reason not to use HTML5 for all my projects from now on? Um, not really. The, the only reason I can think of uh, not to use HTML5 is, as I said, the validator is now perhaps a less useful tool. If you've been using the validator as a lint tool, as a way of telling you when you forgot to close an attribute, uh, to quote an attribute or you forgot to close a, a tag, then that's a reason not to use HTML5 in some senses. But really, uh, apart from that, you can, at, at the very least, you know, just swap out your doc type for doc type HTML, suddenly you're using HTML5. I mean, really, you're using HTML5 anyway because 90% of what's in HTML5 is what's already in HTML4, XHTML 1.0. Um, I think there's more reasons to use it, and that would be to do things like using uh, input typical search, using placeholder attributes, little things like that. Um, no reason, no reason not to, really. Uh, if you're going to use these new elements, section, side, nav, you can use them and you can start styling them in any browser except one. <laughs> <laughs> so for Internet Explorer, you uh, have to do this weird trick where you have to make it recognize the elements, and it's, it's totally bizarre. So to make Internet Explorer understand a new element, let's say I made a new element called foo, okay? If I, in JavaScript, if I say document.createElement foo, now I can style elements called foo. It doesn't make any sense. This is actually something I've been using for years because Internet Explorer didn't understand and didn't uh, support the abbreviation element for 10 years. So in order to make it understand the abbreviation,